time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Gary Wayne. Gary, welcome to Babylon Buster. Well, so so happy to be here and, and do an interview with you, with you, David. You know, you're a legend in in this uh, industry, and uh, I'm just so happy to be here and uh, and do a show do a show with you. Thank you, Gary. I'm a legend in my own mind. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. I'm a legend in my own mind, and you know, like I said, we're just a little bit tired. We've John, old John Pounders has worked us pretty hard. He's a slave driver. And I just feel like asking you, what's on your heart? What's your takeaway from all this? Just what is the Lord putting oh, on your heart? Yeah, such a good question. Such a sense of uh, unification and unification of spirit that was going on, particularly at the end of the conference. And, you know, all the different types of conversations and things were just kind of really brought together. And so to, to witness that and uh, just just raises your spirit and, you know, gives you a hope that, you know, there's a real awakening that maybe is going to actually start beginning in Evansville is what was discussed. So, I mean, I found that absolutely heartwarming and, and I was very proud and fortunate and humbled to be part of. So I'm not sure I was worthy enough to be in that room with the rest of those such terrific Christians. but. I, you know, I just am um, overwhelmed by it all. I just really am overwhelmed and humbled by it. And I don't think there are very many conferences that had as much information as went out. I mean, it was information overload between you and Rob. And it was just an amazing amount of information. But I believe it turned out to be more than just an inform informational seminar and conference that there was a real challenging to all of us as children of God to come together to see those loftier goals that God looks at that he wants his people to unify around and uh, there's just that sense and I get the I get the distinct feeling when I wait in is that I'm in way over my pay grade and <laughs> I really do but I know that only with the Lord's help that we can do anything. The Lord won't call us to do anything that mm -hmm. He will not empower us to do right. and enable us to accomplish. And I agree. I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful to get to know you. I really am. I, uh, I've been challenged by your work, and I really appreciate it. And I guess I would start by asking you, uh, one of the things that we agree in, a, in an area where I have taught this for 20 years. Well, I don't know if 20 years. I've taught it for a long time. I'm not going to say 20 years. I'm not sure. It's been a long time, a lot of years. And I have taught what I've called six-day man, where Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are not one creation event but two. And I found great encouragement when I read your book that you might have got hit on the head with the same rock I did. <laughs> and I have not found another believer in these many years that believe Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are two creation events. Right. And I would just like to hear from you how you came to be persuaded of that. Well, I think with everything that I do uh, in my approach, 
approach, and the approach that I have um, in, in my book is, is I try and ask critical questions and I try and make uh, good secondary critical questions thereafter and I try and make sense of things so that it, it makes sense to me. And I, I firmly believe in the Word of God and I firmly believe in the Bible and I do not believe the Bible is in contradiction. So if there's something I don't understand, what I generally do is I dig deeper into the Bible and I tend to always find 100% of the time that there isn't really a contradiction, particularly if you just let the words flow and yeah. read it as, as it is written um, and not try and go in with a preconceived idea that you might have been taught before and that's why I call myself a contrarian. I like to verify for myself and um, continue to expand what my learning is um, on the Bible and, and, and whatever else I'm trying to do. So when I read chapter one and chapter two, I was having a lot of difficulty in reconciling the two stories as being the same story because they seem to be similar but different. And I also believe in a concept that what the Bible does, so I'm careful of it before I start to go down this road, is that whether it's the four Gospels, for example, when we're talking about Jesus, is they have different stories, right, to a certain degree. But they're all telling the same story, but they're not in conflict, even though each of them may have some other aspects that aren't in the other ones. And it just sort of expands on what happened and that's what the Bible does in a lot of cases. It keeps revisiting and adding and giving you more information. So I try to apply that one before I go and say, well, I can't reconcile the two. And I didn't find that that seemed to be the case because it didn't make sense from adding more information. You know, it's not like when you first read in the Bible where, you know, two of every kind is taken and then only find one except for clean animals where seven pairs of each kind are taken or seven of each kind, depending on how you want to interpret that. That's not a contradiction. That's an additional piece of information. So the first thing that, you know, you read and you go to day three and that's when plants and vegetation is created. Uh, and then in day six, of course, um, humankind and in Genesis uh, 2, in the Eden account, um, you're talking about Adam being created before this vegetation that precedes talking about Adam being created, right? There's a different order. There's a different order. There's a different well, order. that's kind of interesting, and it's also enlightening in the way that wording is done, but it's different than Genesis 1. It's the same creation account. What I liked about Genesis 2 was, you know, it talks in a very specific language. That's one thing I really like about the Bible. It's very accurate and particular and discriminates with the type of words that it's used because it isn't in, in error. And when it talks about the vegetation, the two types of vegetation it's talking about is, is the uh, shrub of the field and the grass of the field are facing correctly and that these weren't created yet. Um, and when Adam was created, and then it talks about these streams that would come up and flow through them because mm -hmm. uh, there was no rain yet because the, mm -hmm. the flood hadn't taken place yet. Yeah. Okay, well, this is obviously talking to me about an agrarian society, right? So we're talking about uh, farmers and we're talking about planting uh, things like wheat and uh, food crops and orchards and things like that organized. And in fact, later on there, it, it brings... Um, Adam back to be the farmer, right? Yeah. And they are vegetarians, right? They're vegetarians yeah. from the Adamic line at least through Seth all the way through to Noah and only after the flood um, is Noah and thus the descendants from Noah permitted to eat meat after that, right? Okay, so they're vegetarian agrarians. And then I look at the description of the people described in day six. And there's no talk about this organized farming with this vegetation that's in a different order and, and men are created later, but it's like, it's just, they're growing, it's growing wild, right? Yeah. It's not organized. Yeah. So this is, this is like being hunters and gatherers. Yeah. And I know there's some uh, push and pull back on, did they hunt meat based on how it's or you go a little bit further in, in terms of how the food is provided. But if you go back and look at when the Bible was written, that they didn't have these verse numbers. Everything was together. Yeah. And then looked at, and this is for food for you, and you have the vegetation 
and the animals, yeah. you could look at that and say they are hunters and gatherers. Yeah. And the Adamites were agrarians, and that's why I call them the agrarians of Genesis in my book, because they started uh, this civilization of agrarians, and yeah. that's where Cain learned that and then exported it to, which is also kind of problematic. Um, in the uh, Genesis account if we don't have two different creations, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. And then I had another problem with the creation of, of, of male and female. They were created at the same time, which is different than in the Eden account. And seemingly male and multiple, female created plural, the, them, plural. them. Yeah, in yeah. multiples and told to um, increase and multiply and spread out through the earth. And of course, that's not what is done with Adam at the beginning. Right. And uh, we don't hear about that fruitful and multiply till later on in the Adamic line. Yeah. Now, so, one of the big problems I've always had, and a lot of people have thought about this, you know, where did Cain get his wife? And, you know, they'll mm -hmm. say, well, he is the Lord. He doesn't change. Incest is wrong. Where did Cain get his wife? He had sex with his sister. Yes. You know, just, yeah. just doesn't come out right. Yeah. And the way the Lord set it up on the sixth day, male and female created he them. He allowed the human race to procreate without incest. Yes. And that allowed Cain also to marry a sixth day woman, if you will. Absolutely. And that's what I, I would call a sixth day man. Yes. And I have begun to wonder if perhaps the Neanderthals were six day men. Well, that's, uh, I've thought about that as well, and it certainly is a possibility. Were they as evolved? Were they identical to us, or were they not? Right? And, then, and I think there's a hidden history about Neanderthals that hasn't been properly explored from when they existed, what happened to them, and where they, they were located. And then I believe they were located all around the world, and I think we're starting to see some indications of that, not just the ones that are in France, which are the typical ones. But I think if, if all the information does come out, I think they're going to find down the road if they release it, that's a big if in a lot of cases, um, that they were in a lot more regions than uh, just um, Europe. So it could very possibly be. Or um, maybe these, there were also four races of the people of day six, right? Yeah. And we don't know that as well. And, and again, we don't know who the wives were that went on the ark. And, and maybe some of those wives were picked from the races of the people that were in day six as well. Some people think there was a little funky DNA yeah. Yeah. on the ark. Yeah. I won't mention any names. Yeah. And but um, I had never considered this until we were having a Bible study one night. Mm -hmm. And there was a good brother from over around, it was from Ohio County, Kentucky. And he put forth this proposition to me. And I said, nah, 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 can't be. And he just kept coming back. And his name is George Moore. Hi, Brother George, if you ever <laughs> see this, hey, you're to blame for my trek here, as you well know. But the more I looked at it, the more... I could not deny, and I think you're like me in this way, that if you believe the Bible teaches something, you'll go with that no matter who thinks what. Yeah, exactly. And if I look at it, where, where does this wife of Cain come from? And people say, well, it's a daughter of Adam and Eve, and of course you have the incest issue as, as well that you had brought up. But if you read in Genesis 5, I think, on the account of Adam and another accounting, there's some very strange wording in there. I'm not going to spend time on that right now. But um, when we look at um, when um, Seth was born, it's 130 years later. And then it says Adam and Eve had uh, other daughters and uh, sons or sons and daughters. Just yeah. as it says that again with Seth after um, Enosh is born, if I've got the order right here. Yeah. And so... Um, it seems that that's a long time. So, I mean, but we don't know at what point in time uh, Cain left or was, uh, you know, forced to leave to go to Nod. Um, but when he goes to Nod, um, does he go back and get, or does he take at the same time? It doesn't seem to say. It seems like he has a wife that's in the Nod area yeah. uh, as opposed to going back and getting a wife that may not even be there. And yet what's even more odd is he's building seas. For who? Yeah. Cain got him one of them six-day women, yeah. one of them six-day nod women. Yeah. And cities and, with uh, walls, if you get into some yeah. of the uh, other histories that oh, yeah. we record. And, and that and, makes and, perfect sense. Yeah. And for some of you listening that think that 
we might have been dropped on our head as a child. Just consider I was, this. But <laughs> well, I've I've heard a mom tell stories. I'm suspicious of that too. But look at the order in Genesis chapter one. The animals were created first, and then man. Genesis chapter two, different order. Absolutely. The animals were created. God brought them to Adam to yes, name them. To name. Yep. Adam was already there. Different yes. order. Yep. And if you put Adam and Eve in chapter yep. 1, you just have to wish them there. They're not there. Absolutely. And if you put the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 1, you, you have, have to, to wish, wish it, it there. there. And it's this same old thing. Yep. You, it, there's eisegesis and exegesis. Yes. And when you do exegesis, you draw from the Word of God. And yes. when you do eisegesis, you read into it. And you've got to read it into it to get it there. It's not there. Yes. And exactly. you just got to make it up out of yeah. whole cloth. Yeah, and the arguments that I, I hear when it, when this gets challenged is is that it goes back to really you know doctrine being taught, and it's arguing from a preconceived conclusion instead of saying what's there. And then there's tradition. One, tradition, uh, yeah, and I think and tradition um, is caused by the deceitful heart that we the all have. The deceitful heart. If I, if and I the quoted under, you right from the conference. There it is, and that, <laughs> me, that's over and over and over again. Yes, we fall, and I. And like I say, I'm tired of repenting. I'm tired of repenting the tradition, and I still, it's, it's ongoing, isn't yeah. it? It's ongoing. Absolutely. And the extent to which we yeah. have been traditionalized yeah. instead of Christianized yeah. is mind-boggling. Yeah, and when I came back to God, I wanted to read for myself. And I didn't want to hear what other people said, and that's kind of just my nature. But And so that's why... These things sort of run out with me as being different, and I wanted to find a way to to resolve it in my own mind because I, you know, at that point I'm thinking, okay, now on faith, I think this is the word of God, and I'd like to think that it's not in contradiction. It should be, should not be from the yeah. word of God. And then there's and one other is. contradiction in there that really is kind of puzzling, a small little detail, but it said that in day six, people that all the trees they could eat from. But in the Eden account, there's one that they're not permitted to eat from. Now, maybe that's an addition and maybe it's not. But again, it just seems to be that's kind of not what it said back on day six. So from the tree of yeah. good and evil. The Garden of Eden isn't even in chapter one. And the Garden not, of Eden not, is not. And, and again, I mean, I know I, I had to read this over and over and over and over just to get um, the tradition out of my head because I was reading it. I didn't like that it wasn't making sense, but it was saying, okay, but this is just a further story of day six. And, and I couldn't get there, but my mind wouldn't let me let go of it until I started to make sense. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time on this just because it was driving me crazy. So, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm open to hearing the argument on how these can be dovetailed. Um, but I think we should just let it read what it is, and it starts to answer so many questions about prehistory if you just let it read. It really read. does. And Genesis chapter 1, we have multiple men and women that were given a mandate to go into the earth, multiply, and subdue it. Yes. Genesis chapter 2, we have Adam and Eve that were told to go to the garden and till it. Yes. Two groups of people, yes. two different places, two different mandates. Yes. And then we look at how Eve is created. Well, they're not created at the same time and not in plural, but now from a rib, and we're talking about an expansion of, you know, like DNA multiplication or however you want to do it. I'm not a scientist, but what I do know is, is that is a totally unique individual made from the source for a specific re reason to be our partner, right? Yeah. And that's not what day six is telling us. That's not it's telling not. me that. It's not that personal, it's not that one source, it's not for a specific sort of new man, to call it that, if, if this is true, a new man not in the polytheist Nazi understanding, but the new man uh, that is, is brought in that is going to be the seed that is going to permit humankind to be raised above angels. Yeah. And then the other thing that I look at in terms of day six in the garden is, is we don't know what the time frame is now between then and when Adam is brought on. It could be hundreds of thousands of years. It could be a year. We're not told. Don't know. We don't know when. And that sort of frees us up that if we talk about the lineage of Adam as being 6,000 years, okay, fine. It's 6,000 years. It doesn't mean anything more than that. 
in time before that. Yeah. Now here, oh, I'm going to feel frisky. I'm going to read a scripture. Oh, my goodness. Roll out old King Jimmy here and read a scripture. All right. Now here's the conclusion I come to. Genesis 6 and 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. When was that? The day six. Perfect language, perfect symmetry. That's when men begin to yes. multiply. Then, just like it says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And I believe, just from what it says, that when they were created on day six, male and female, that when those daughters were old enough, that that was the first incursion yes. of fallen angels. And then I believe I'm the second. Back, back up. So you're saying a first incursion on day six. Yes, okay. right there, because that's what it says. It says when men begin to multiply, that's when it happened. And they begin to multiply on day six. Therefore, I just simply believe that when those day six people, when those daughters were fair game, that that was the first defection of fallen angels. And I believe that this was the rebellion of Lucifer. Okay. Yeah. And as we saw in Lucifer, of course, he was a breeder. And it says yes. that he shook the nations. And here again, what nations? Yes. You know, and at the time, of course, it's past tense. Yes. Which did weaken the yep. nations. Yes. Well, it certainly would answer a question on why the daughters of Cain, in this case, the uh, of that lineage and those other peoples would be predisposed to um, being wives of uh, of these uh, watchers because it would be part of the culture and part of the tradition and the ritual. So yeah. that would make some sense. And I hadn't looked at that verse uh, before you mentioned it in that sort of aspect, but uh, yeah, I can see there's a connection there. I think I want to, I'm going to have to mull this one over. Because... This is the conclusion. <laughs> you see, it's just like everything. Once you realize yep. that Genesis chapter 1 and chapter yep. 2, that there are two creation events instead yep. of one, everything you yes. look at, of course, you got a new yep. lens to yep. look at it through. Yep. And then I believe there was that second incursion, yep. which was Enoch chapter 6 and the days of Jared, 200 come down. And now yep. that Skiba fellows got me convinced that that was it, that there was another incursion. There wasn't another yes. one after that. Yep. And that's where I'm at it with that, it, where I'm at with it right now. And I have tweaked this. You know, I mean, we're Star Trek in here because there's no book you can pull down to read about this stuff. You just yeah. got to kind of keep pecking at it and yeah. then you think you got it all and then, yeah. oh, here's something else. And I've been tweaking on this and studying it a long time. And it's just marvelous. Mm -hmm the depth of God's so, Word, how, how much we can know by absolutely. just looking at Scripture, the answers to ancient civil, it just amazes yep. me what and, God puts in His Word. And just to sort of add to what you're, doing, what you're saying, um, because there's another, some, I said there's some odd language in uh, Genesis 5, and this may throw a little bit more support to what you're saying as I think this through. So when you talk about the birth of Seth, and he's born in the likeness of Adam, right? Why would yeah. it say that? Why is there this pointing out that he had to look like Adam? What's that all about? Is it suggesting there's something different either about Cain or about the people of day six? Like, why does the Bible and the writers feel it important to point that out? If he's the son of Adam and Eve, he should be like Adam, right? That would follow. Him. That would be not, and so it's a redundant and the Bible doesn't work that way. There's no, something God important. doesn't mince words, does it? Yeah, there's something important to that. And yeah. I'm not going down the serpent seed line from the, the descendant of Cain. I'm just saying there's something going on here that it was felt necessary to um, say that about um, Seth, that he looked like his father, Adam. Yeah. And in the garden... When Adam and Eve were in the garden, the Genesis chapter 2 scenario, the Bible tells people there, and I always use my little flanagraph analogy that when I was told about the Garden of Eden, those well-meaning, lovely little ladies, 
Sunday school didn't give me quite the whole picture. Yeah. And uh, we, we had Adam and we had Eve and the little snake in the tree and the animals. But in Ezekiel 28, it talks about the king of Tyre. Yes. That was in the Garden of Eden. Yes. And uh, I got to believe that he was in the Garden of Eden. And in Ezekiel 31, it talks about the Assyrian that was in the Garden of Eden. And it tells about the judgment scenario where that he was driven out. The same language used of Adam that they were driven. And it talks about, you can see there in Ezekiel 31, that there was a flood. And it says that God restrained it. It wasn't total devastation as with Noah, which tells us that all of six-day man were not destroyed. There were survivors from that flood. And, and my concept right now is the best that I can understand it, that at the time, I believe at the time that Adam and Eve fell, that not only Adam, but the Assyrian and the king of Tyre were driven yep. out. Yep. God brought a horrific judgment, but not yep. total. And there were some six-day men, and they had over the land to nod a few six-day chicks for so, king to find. So going, again, just building on your um, uh, conclusions here, if there was an incursion with the people of day six by fallen angels at that time, and Genesis 6 is the second uh, violation against creation, and if we go with what it says in the flood narrative where it says that... Um, other than the ones, the people that are on the ark, all other people in animals and vegetation he created was uh, destroyed. Then you could make an argument based on that, that a, um, not only the Nephilim of uh, Genesis 6 weren't created by God and may somehow survive, and people from day six. And if that's the case, that would be another possibility to the four races, right? And I think we talked about, I mentioned earlier about um, possibly if that's the case that the four wives represented the uh, wives on the ark, you could also make the case that they could represent um, Nephilim DNA. That's because there's only three ways that the Nephilim can survive the flood, right? Second incursion, survive the flood, or on the ark somehow, some way. Right, so there's only this three just ways opens of doing up, it. Yeah. Th this lens just spreads a wide angle, doesn't it? Yeah. Now I think you know, it's either in the book of Yasher, and I can't remember right now off the top of my head. Um, it does say that the wives did come from the line of, of uh, the daughters of Methuselah or somebody in that range. I'd have to go back and double check. But again, that doesn't mean that they were pure, right? So just because they came from the line, you can use the argument that everybody on the ark is pure. And it's a pure start with just these six, right? But we're only told and can verify through the Bible that only Noah, his wife, and the three sons are pure. And the wives are still up for speculation, and there's nothing in the Bible that talks about the wives. So even if I use something that, like Yasher or Enoch, I still can't 100% say that that would be the case one way or the other, with whatever the wives were, pure, hybrid, DNA, or from other races. Don't know, but it opens those possibilities up, is, I guess is where I'm going with that. It certainly does. I want to ask you something now that we've been talking about here. And as far as I know, I honestly believe we're going to talk about something and present it to people that has never been presented. And another thing that you and I share in common is our belief in the reality a priori of science. There are many Christian apologists that, that say that the priori didn't exist, that it was just the creation of Pierre Plantard, that it cannot be documented outside of his testimony. But I want to read something to you from Morals and Dogma, and I'd like you to give the, uh, their opinion. And the priori of science was the secret society that supposedly created the Knights Templar. And I want to read from Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, page 816, and another portion in 817. And I believe absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt that Mr. Pike is talking about the priori. Okay. And I want to read this to you, and you can comment. Now, this is what Mr. Pike said. 816, Morals and Dogma. 
There existed at that period in the East a sect of Johannite Christians who claimed to be the only true initiates into the real mysteries of the religion of the Savior. They pretended to know the real history of Jesus the Anointed and adopting in part the Jewish traditions and tales of the Talmud, they held that the facts recounted in the evangels are but allegories. He goes on to say, the Johannites ascribed to St. John the foundation of their secret church and the grand pontiffs of the sect assumed the titles of Christos anointed or consecrated and claimed to have succeeded one another from St. John by an uninterrupted succession of pontifical powers. He who at the period of the foundation of the order of the temple claimed these imaginary prerogatives was named Theoclet. He knew Hughes de Pans, he initiated him into the mysteries and hopes of his pretended church. He seduced him by the notion of the sovereign priesthood and supreme royalty. What do you think, Brother Gary? Well, that's the first time I've heard that. Um, Here, you can, if you'd like, you can. Uh, and I know you read it earlier, and you can yep, take another yeah, look at it. And, and, you know, I certainly wish, and I, and I, I quote morals and dogmas in, in my book, as, as you're aware. Uh, I wish I had this in my book. Because uh, it's just a, a super validation as to the groups that were shaping this organization. So, um, yeah. So um, I missed that, and I want to thank you for, for for pointing that out. But let me just sort of expand on this a little bit so that our listeners have a little bit uh, better so understanding. Do, do you do you believe Mr. Pike is talking about the priory there? Yeah, that's that's the priory. That's it is. Yeah. I and mean, he, it's as, so you, yeah, to you me, have, it's plain as day. Yes. And, and they introduce uh, Hugh de Pan into the mysteries, but a certain type of mysteries, and he's already into the mysteries. And the other significant fellow in the creation of the uh, Knights Templar is, is Godfrey de Bouillon. Uh, and Godfrey is, is actually the extension of this bloodline that they believe in, that they found uh, these genealogies at the temple from the Essenes and the scrolls from the scenes that hid there at the time of the destruction of the temple as validation uh, and proof of what they believed to be their bloodline. But this was a group, uh, and Godfrey had met with a group of Calabrian monks in about 1090, and then the Calabrian monks went to, to Jerusalem to prepare for Godfrey and the Pan and the uh, nine other ones that came there to do the work. And sometime between 1090 and 1099, they took the name of the Order of Sion, uh, as an alternative name to the Order of the Temple, which was going to become the Templar organization. And so this was made up of a group of, of mystic underground conclaves with, that were hidden within the one Catholic Church or the Universal Church of Christianity of that time uh, as, as moles and secret organizations. And so you have the Johannite Brothers, which is a significant one, also that were kind of a mix of the Nazarenes, which is kind of a, the same type of sect coming out of the same time at the time of Simon the Magus, Magus which they would have recognized as one of those leaders that you were referring to. And that's one of the reasons why Simon the Magus is, is also in, in the Bible. And so um, they had this continual procession of people that were leading this alternative uh, Gnostic Christianity that's been absorbed in cosmology of polytheism and perverted and keeps Jesus as a prophet and not the word of God and a deity and the son of God and everything we know of him as and our redeemer and everything we know of him in Christianity. So that's that group. And then you have the Calabrian monks, which were Gnostic and believed in the Pythagorean uh, mysteries and, and held that. So again, nice little mix in there. And then you had... Um, the, uh, the organization out of Egypt of the followers of Saint of Ormus. And Ormus is, is a significant name in history and in going forward uh, that I'm going to come back to as part of a name of a ritual that happened in about 1188, as I recall. And so you have all of that coming together with the descendants of the Merovingians 
to substantiate their bloodline to form this rouge of an order um, as a guise to go dig in the temple. And as I said, they called themselves as an alternative name, at least according to Stephen Sora, and I think there's a couple other references, and I think if my memory writes uh, from Albert Mackey, he will also call a uh, name the order of the temple as well, sort of bringing this together, which would make some sense in the history of Freemasonry. Now, this is something that I never picked on up on before talking with you, that Mackey in his history talked about an order of the temple before there was an order of the temple. Yes. So who's Mackey talking about? Yeah, he's talking about this order of the Red Cross that goes all the way back uh, and was reconstituted at the time of Constantine, uh, but actually goes back to these builder guilds, right? These, like the Manichaeans and the Johannanites mold themselves into the builder guilds, the collegia of, of uh, Italy, uh, and so that's how they were able to get protection and become important because the church needed somebody to build the churches, right? Yeah. And, and this goes back to the order of the two temple buildings and back to the Essenes and the princes of Jerusalem. And uh, it actually goes back to the Di Di Dionysus or the Dionysian, I'm going to struggle with this word, the Di Dionysian builders um, who built all of the ancient temples, whether it's in Greece or in the Middle East, and they connect themselves back to the antediluvian epoch. And so that's why masonry has this long stream and connection with all of these mystical organizations and the fifth science of masonry and geometry. So um, this is an order that goes way back and that's why if, I, if my memory serves me correct and I'm gonna uh, go back and look it up and try and send you the references on that um, as it refers to the Templars. Um, and if, I know there's some uh, versions online, but they don't have the whole book of uh, the history of Freemasonry that Albert Mackey put out. So it's important to have the, the original on this one. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, uh... And what's interesting is, is that what people don't understand is, is after 1188, or before 1188, you don't have a list of the Grand Masters of the Priory of Sion. And this is according to what is supposedly the forged documents of Plantart who also has a name that's connected to the Sinclairs, Plantard yeah. de St. Clair, which yeah. is, St. Clair was one of the founding Templars, which most people don't know. Yeah. So it was when there's nine, there was actually 11. Yeah. And part of this whole enclave that they're not part of it, but it's the Cistercian monks, which are Gnostic and yeah. developed the seven liberal arts as well, and the uh, Benedictine nuns. And there were two Cistercian knights or monks that were also part of the original founders of the of the Knights Templar. So yeah. this thing is just uh, ripe with uh, Gnosticism and polytheism and, and secret societies and moles in the church. So bef there's a an event that happens in 1188 in their belief and in their writings that was called the cutting of the elm, and that's because what happened was is is the Priory of Sion felt Templars had lost their way. They were more interested in greed and wealth and banking and all the things that they were growing fabulously wealthy on and they created the banking system for us and that's another rabbit hole to go down to on, on maybe another show. And so they split and they called it yeah. the cutting of the elm at Geezer's, <laughs> at Geezer's Castle and the Geezers are all part of the Priory of Sion and the and uh, the Rex Deus uh, bloodlines yeah. and all connect back to the Templars as well and Sinclair's marrying into them. I'm going to finish this up very quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, Gary, you notice? Look at all these wonderful people. They're waving their hands yes. like birds and stuff. I think they want us to wrap this up. So they do. let's wrap it up for Wrap it Gary. up. And, wrap it up. And the elm tree in French is called Orme and that connects back to Ormus and this sort of Gnostic ritual. And so therefore, if you want to see the Grand Masters of the Priory Sion go back further into history, those are the Grand Masters of the Templars. Because there were one organization at that time and were brought together at that one time to do the agenda that they had created, which would include 
creating a universal religion and world government even back at that time, but because they split in 1188, they have different Grand Masters, right? So if you want to follow the Grand Masters after that, on the split after the fall of the Templars, then you got to go into uh, Scottish Freemasonry and pick things up from there. But that again, that's a whole different story, but I think I just kind of wrapped and pulled things together there for you at the end. I think you did too. Thank you. Gary, we could just keep talking. We could. And we just see, keep talking. We'll have to do it again, yeah. and we'll be talking soon. And, yeah. and you can see how passionate I get. I get so wound yeah, up. Yeah, well, it's I just, time to I get, get excited passionate. When we it's talk time about to get passionate. Things. And yeah. we just want to thank everyone that's tuning into Babylon Busters. This is what you can expect. We're going to challenge. and sisters it is the remnant warrior here from kingdom productions and publishing and i just want to welcome all of you to our youtube channel and if you haven't already subscribed i just want to ask that you would take this time to just hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you know each and every time that we upload new content and for those of you who don't already watch this channel on a regular basis I want to let you know that we upload new content several times a week but at least every week so you don't want to miss out when we upload something new Thank you all in advance for your subscription. I love each and every one of you. Until next time, God bless you all.